You are listening to a sermon by Pastor Christopher Sally of New Life Christian Fellowship Church. The problem with entanglements and many of us are aware that this subject has come up recently in the context of what's known as a a red table talk, amen? I'll preach it by myself if I have to, but, but, but you know what I'm talking about. I said it came up in the context of a red table talk. And this red table talk, uh, revealed that that somebody got into what she described as what an entanglement and the person that she was describing it to was her husband and his face was a face of one that said you know what you you might need to explain that just a little bit more so folks really understand what it means when you say entanglement because that that sounds like that may be a little bit less than what it actually is and she said no no it was a it was a relationship so that got me that got me thinking that got me chewing on this as we are looking at um being kingdom strong amen and and we were looking just last week at uh submission as one of those those uh skills that we need to to build we need to raise our kingdom uh, skill, just like we said we wanted to uh, refine our, our kingdom sight, raise our kingdom skill, uh, rely on our kingdom resources, and remember our kingdom struggle so that we might be able to be in a place where God would have us to be, which is to be what? Kingdom strong. This is the 20th message in that series, amen? And so it's on point and it's in context when we start to talk just a little bit about this is one of those things that it literally is the title is ripped from the headlines, if you will, talking about the problem with entanglements. And when I heard her, uh, her say that word and I know we've laughed at a bunch of different memes that have been floating around on Instagram and Twitter and 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 even folks that uh, I saw one that was that a young man was imitating one of uh, the more well-known preachers and he was going through and he was talking about entanglement and he was talking about folks seeing August in July and all those other kind of things and it was funny and it was interesting and all of that but there is a serious underlying issue when you're talking about entanglement and the verse that came to mind immediately to me was no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier amen and so even though there are things that would be what we call the purient interest uh, or, or las- lascivious kind of details when you talk about entanglements, that's not what I want to talk about this morning. That, that clearly is an entanglement and particularly when you're in a committed relationship and, and you've made vows to one another and there's a, there's a desire that you have to please the other person, you should not find yourself in anything called an entanglement amen but you have a committed relationship as well and you can sit down at the red table with your lord and savior and he would be just as disappointed if he understood that you said instead of doing the things that i need to do trying to please you because you called me to be a soldier i found myself entangled in the affairs of this life and if you find yourself entangled beloved in the affairs of this life that means that you're disobedient which means by definition you can't be obedient and obedience beloved is the skill you need if you're going to be kingdom strong 
We talked about a few of those in that in that uh, discussion around what how we need to raise our kingdom skill. We talked last week just about submission and we focused on on uh, uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus. And I told you submission is the right attitude. But I also told you as I previewed this, that submission is the right attitude. Obedience is the right action. And those things are truly symbiotic. Amen. You have to have the right attitude and then you have to follow through with the right action because Jesus should be able to say we should be able to say to follow you means to follow through. These are the kind of words that I told you that you don't really hear too much in Christian circles. I gave you seven of them before and submission was one. Obedience was another responsibility, suffering, consequences, um, sacrifice and holiness. This is this is another one we're dealing with. Obedience is here because no man that warreth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life that he may please him that called him to be a soldier. That's why verse three says now there. Well, start in verse one of chapter two. It says, thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So again, you don't have to do this thing by yourself. God has given you grace and he says, I need you to be strong in that grace. And the things that thou hast heard among me, among many witnesses, the same commit thou unto what? Faithful men that may be able to teach others also. Thou therefore then endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. See, Paul is trying to put us in the mindset where we understand that we are soldiers and the most important thing a soldier can do is follow orders. The, the most important thing that a soldier can do is what? Is follow orders. And he says, listen, in order to do that, you're going to have to, you're going to literally have to um, um, endure hardship. Amen. You're going to have to endure hardship. And then here, here comes the part where we, we kind of clamp down on this morning. And then it says, no man that war entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier and so here's the overarching encouragement the apostle Paul is giving and giving us a military picture so that we can really and truly understand he says I need you to engage with focus there's a difference beloved between uh, existing or 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 uh, or or uh, and, and, and engaging and, and the best example that I can give you that is from a very popular movie that most of us have seen called Top Gun. There was a time when Maverick, played by Tom Cruise, was having an issue and he was, come on somebody, he literally was on the sidelines. His partner died and many things happen in ministry and when you're out on the field, there, you, you stop being on the front line so much and then many times we find ourselves on the sidelines of ministry and on the sidelines of what God has called us to do. We're on the sidelines typically be, for two reasons, because either we're scared or we're scarred. We're scared because we've seen what has happened to others as they have engaged in ministry because Engaging in ministry and doing what God calls you to do requires sacrifice and we understand it's costly and we'll talk about that. We've seen people's uh, trajectory of their lives change and things happen to them and so we're scared. We don't want to do what God called us to do because it may cost us too much so we're scared amen the other reason folks are on the sideline is because they're scarred that's because they've been out there they've been on the battlefield they've seen what has happened they've got the wounds to prove it and because something has happened to them they decide i no longer want to engage but maverick had an assignment and and 
He needed to fly out to a location where one of his fellow officers was flying and he literally got into a place where the enemy engaged him with five planes. It was one against five. This is the Americans versus the Russians. They, the, these planes that they were flying were faster. They were more maneuverable. And it was like he said, I, I just won't survive. And, said, and so they said, Maverick, get out there. So Maverick flies. Maverick is flying out there. But there's a difference, beloved, between flying and engaging. And there was a point where he got out there and he just said, nah, it's, it's not right. It's not right. And Iceman said, darn it, I knew it. Maverick is not engaging. There's a difference, beloved, between simply flying and engaging. And it kept encouraging him and encouraging him. And finally it kicked in. He said, I got to set aside my fear. I got to set aside because they need me in the fight. And then he finally engaged and they were able to be victorious. But again, it's because they got, they celebrated. There was a, there was a call and went out and said, Maverick's engaging. And that's what I'm trying to get you to understand that as a soldier, we can't just be, uh, the uniform that we've been issued and the weaponry we've been issued is not for parade formation. It's for battle. It's for war. And so we need to be engaged with focus because if we're not, we're not good soldiers. And he said, you know how you become a good soldier? The Apostle Paul says, you don't entangle yourself. You don't let yourself get entangled, beloved, with the affairs of this life, with all of the things that could happen in this life. He says you have to engage with focus because the mission is I've got to do what matters for the master who has called me to serve and I don't want to do anything else and I will do it. Why? Because I need the approval of him who has chosen me to be a soldier. In an army, by the way, that you volunteered for, not drafted to, you, you volunteered to be a part of, the, of, to be a soldier of the cross. Amen. You and I volunteered to do that. And so the apostle Paul says, well, since you're here, do your job. Engage. You can't get entangled. Why? Because entanglement leads to disobedience. You won't follow orders if you're entangled. And I need you more than anything else, soldier, to follow orders. I could tell you that as a picture of obedience in scripture, and that's what we're talking about. When we talk about following orders, we're talking about obedience. The Bible is replete with stories and it's very interesting and the narratives are very colorful and there's a lot of back and forth and some other things. But if people literally did what they were supposed to do, the Bible would be half his size. There's nothing so terribly interesting about receiving information from God and carrying it out. That only takes a couple of verses. Let me, let me show you. I alluded to them last week. Just like Mary is a picture of submission, her husband Joseph is a picture of of obedience mm -hmm. the orders come in and the verses are so simple in Matthew chapter 1 the, the angel of the Lord comes to Joseph and tells him all about how this child will be born and, and what it means and in verse 24 simply says when Joseph woke up from the dream he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him that's it turn over to turn over to Matthew 2 and, and 14 when they had gone an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph again in a dream get up take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt stay there until I tell you for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him verse 14 says so he got up and took the child and his mother that's it verse 21 after Herod died, verse 19, the angel of the Lord appeared to a dream in Joseph and said, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. Verse 21, so he got up, took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. Verse 22 says, but when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea, a place where his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee so that... He he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. I mean, this is really, really, really not exciting stuff. But it's not supposed to be. 
In the days of Caesar Augustus, it says it issued a decree that all the world should be taxed and everyone went to his own town to register. That's in Luke chapter two and verse four says, so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth. Joseph just simply did what Joseph was asked to do when the time of his purification, according to the law, law of Moses, had been completed. This is Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. He simply did what he was asked to do and it says in verse 39 when joseph and mary had done everything required by the law of the lord they returned to galilee to their own town of nazareth i'm telling you these are all of the the prominent mentions of joseph in scripture you don't see any situation in scripture where joseph is talking back joseph is asking questions joseph just said let the information come to me and i'll execute it i'm a soldier Do you know how hard it would be to be Jesus' stepfather mm -mm. <laughs> when his real daddy is the creator and sustainer of all life? Mm. When people are whispering behind your back at the grocery store, when you've told them before and they read the National Enquirer and heard that, that, that Mary had a baby and it was a, it was a immaculate conception, the giggles he got when he went to Walmart. When he's shopping at Costco. What's up, Joseph? Mm -hmm. How you doing, man? Doing fine. How, how's that wife of yours, that baby? It's, it's everything, everything good? Everything good? Okay. But you know what they're really saying. Mm -hmm. But here's what I love. In John chapter 1. And I think this is, this is just a fitting, I don't say a capstone on this discussion, but I think it's a fitting capstone because of all of the names. Jesus was called many names. He was, he was called son of the most high. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. He was called son of God for sure. And, and he was called son of the most high uh, uh, when the angel appeared to Mary, son of the most high. There was another instance where he was called son of the most high God, son of God, son of man, son of David, which really connects him to Israel. And then here's this one verse in John 1 and 45 when Philip and Andrew were from Bethsaida and Philip found Nathaniel and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. You know what? I got to believe if Joseph would have overheard that conversation, a smile would have broken off across his face. Of all the names he could have been, we found Jesus of Nazareth, the son of God. Yep, the son of man, the son of the most high God, the son of David. Yeah, but in this instance, we thought we, it's the son of Joseph. And for the first time in scripture, it wasn't spoken of in a derisive fashion. Like when Jesus started performing miracles, they would say to him, don't we know this kid? Who is this guy? Isn't this the kid from Galilee? We know his brothers and his, and, and, and his sisters, his mother, his father. Isn't this the son of Joseph? That was kind of derisive, but not in this context. He could have just said, we found him. It's Jesus of Nathers, but it's the son of Joseph. Again, I think that's a, that's a hearkening to his faithfulness, to his obedience. The narrative around Joseph is so simple and the narrative in your life would be simple and the narrative in my life would be simple. We make things so needlessly complicated because we want to do our own thing and we want to do it in our own way and we want to ask questions and we want to have all this back and forth with God. But Joseph has like five or six verses in the Bible and all it says is the information came in, the order came in and Joseph executed on. Joseph got up, Joseph went, Joseph did. Joseph did what he was supposed to do every single time. That's obedience. obedience. And obedience, beloved, is the opposite of entanglement. Mm -hmm. Because no man that wareth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him, please him that called him. called him to be a soldier. And so of all the entanglements we could talk about, I just want to give us three that Jesus gave in Luke chapter 12. And then I want to give us an example of somebody in scripture who got entangled and literally these three entanglements and messed his life up. I just want you to understand the problem of entanglement. And I want to remind myself about the problem with entanglement because entanglement takes you off course. Entanglement 
literally bind you up and you become bound in, in, in something and then you're not able to execute. You're not able to engage with focus. And if you don't do that, you cannot possibly please him who called you and chose you to be a soldier. And soldiers, more than anything else, have to learn how to obey. In the movie A Few Good Men, when, when Tom Cruise, again, was, he was, he was, uh, he was uh, investigating or interrogating uh, one of the lieutenants that was played by Kiefer Sutherland, he said, can a soldier on his own decide which orders he will follow and which orders he will not follow? And Kiefer Sutherland, he cannot. He cannot decide on his own. The orders come in and the work needs to be done. That's how you please him who called you and chose you to be a soldier. In Luke, Luke chapter 12, great passage of, of scripture. And I'm, I, I got to do this quickly because I know our time is, is moving. But it says in verse 12, meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that there shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Neither whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light. And that which ye have spoken in the ear and closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. He said, listen, and there's three things that are right there in, in, in Luke 12, and I'll break it down for you. He says, I need you to be on guard of the leaven of the, of the Pharisees. That's be on guard for hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, beloved, is an entanglement. Hypocrisy is an entanglement. And trust me, the Pharisees were entangled in hypocrisy because they wanted the best seats in, in the synagogue and they synagogue and they wanted to be heard when they were praying but but he says you like the blind leading the blind and both fall into the ditch he says you don't you can't lead anybody else to me because you don't know me yourself it was all about a show with them and you know why it was all about a show with the pharisees because they were motivated by the masses and if you and i want to avoid hypocrisy and the entanglement that comes with it here's jesus's advice don't be motivated by the masses if you are doing things in your life and making decisions based upon trying to please everybody else and trying to look good in front of everybody else and trying to keep the perfect image on Facebook and the, the, the right tweet out on Insta, uh, on Twitter and, and the right post on Instagram. If your life doesn't reflect, if, if, if your social media life doesn't reflect your real life, you're a hypocrite. You're being hypocritical. You're trying to do things for the masses. And Jesus says, be on guard. That's that's the leaven of the Pharisees. That's hypocrisy. Don't be motivated by the masses. That's entanglement. Yes, 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 yes. And then he says, I say unto you, my friends, do not be afraid of them that kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom you should fear. Fear him which after you have killed hath the power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. He says, now be on guard for fear. Be on guard for fear, the, the, the fear of those that are in power that you think can affect your life and kill the body. He said, don't fear them. Don't get caught in that entanglement because what you need to be more concerned about is me. I'm the one that can kill the body and then throw that body into hell. So it says, in, he said, don't be motivated by the masses. The second entanglement is don't be motivated by the mighty. The people in power will be in power. They're going to do what they're going to do. You got to do what's right. Don't fear those that are in power because all they can do is touch your stuff. All they can do is touch your body. He said, you better be worried about the one that, that can put your body in heaven or hell. You're talking about me. Don't be motivated by this world's mighty. That's an entanglement. If you get trapped up into that, you will not be able to please me as a soldier. And then the third thing. And then one of the company in verse 13 said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. He said, Don't be 
motivated by the masses. Don't be motivated by the mighty. Don't be motivated by the money. Come on, somebody. He said, don't be motivated by the money. A man's life cons- does not consist with the... Uh, and with the abundance of the, possess, uh, of the things which he possesses. And he goes on to tell a parable about the, the, the rich man who, who said, what am I going to do with all of the stuff I have? I know what I'll do. I'll build bigger barns so I can store more stuff. But God said unto him, thou fool this night, your soul will be required of thee. Then those, where will be those things which you thought that which thou hast provided? So he said, lay up, uh, so, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. He said, you need to be on guard for hypocrisy. You need to be on guard for fear. You need to be on guard for greed. Don't be motivated by the masses. Don't be motivated by the mighty. Don't be motivated by the money. Those are the entanglements of life that I want to highlight to you today that if you and I are concerned about those things, we will find ourselves entangled. We will find ourselves doing things that take us off course that will never allow us to be pleasing. We'll start making decisions that will be pleasing to, to, to trying to figure out what somebody else is going to do, how they're going to rate us, how they're going to think, how they're going to see us. We'll be we'll be concerned more about about what what happens in terms of what government can do to us as opposed to understanding that our underlying citizenship is really in heaven. And we got to be about the business of the kingdom, no matter the consequences. And we definitely can't sell out and be motivated by the money. He said greed will take you off course. Yeah. Yes, it will. Don't get entangled beloved thinking that the measure of a man's life can be found in the amount of of possessions that he has he said you'll mess your life up yes you will you'll make bad bad decisions and you'll do it like king saul did Hmm. in first samuel as much as Joseph is a picture of obedience and the Bible records his interaction with God and in dreams and it's short. It's a couple of verses here and there and then you don't see anything else about Joseph. Saul is pages and pages and pages of a needlessly complicated interaction. Because he was motivated by the masses, he was motivated by the mighty, and he was motivated by the money. Mm. And in First Samuel, and we'll and we'll we'll look at it. In First Samuel chapter fifteen, God was 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 very clear. He says, "Listen." And God, in my opinion, did something extra too. Sometimes God tells you to do something and he doesn't even tell you why you need to do it. But in this case, he even told Samuel, I mean, told Saul why I need you to do it. Look at verse one. Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint thee the king to be king over his people over over Israel. So I, you got a job. I, I've anointed you. He says, now, therefore, hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Again, here's the relationship. Now we're going to we don't want to end up at the red table where we have to we have to talk about the importance of relationship. He said, listen, I anointed you. That means something. We have a relationship. I'm vested in you. But me being vested in you now means because I anointed you, I need you to do what I say. I need you to come and I need you to do something that that needs to be done. And you're the person that's going to do it. And he says, you remember that it said, thus saith the Lord of hosts. I remember what the Amalekites did to Israel, how they waylaid them or they waited for them when they came up out of the lands of Egypt. He's like, you, the Amalekites thought I forgot about that. I know it's been hundreds of years since it happened, but they waylaid the Israelites when they came out. They attacked them from behind. He says, now here's what I need you to do. Go and smite uh, the Amalekites and utterly destroy them and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and 
suckling, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. Do everything. I need you to utterly destroy the Amalekites. I know it seems harsh, but this is about God's justice. God said, I, I, need, to, I need to make things right. I've, I've let the Amalekites slide this long, and I'm now it's time for me to reckon with them, and I need you to kill every last one of them. And I need you to kill the sheep and the camels, the donkeys, everything. And Saul gathered the people and numbered them. And he came and he smote them. And the scripture says, and Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah to Shur. And he, verse 8, and he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. Hmm. Huh. But Saul and the people spared Agag. And the best of the sheep and the oxen and the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse that they destroyed utterly. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel. I'm upset that I set Saul up to be king for he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel and he cried to the Lord all night. Why did Saul not obey the command of the Lord? Mm. Was it not clear? It was clear. He said, I need you to, to kill everybody and, and, and destroy everything. Mm -hmm. Saul decided that he was going to keep King Agag alive because he wanted to parade him around as a, as a trophy, if you will, of his own dominance over the Amalekites. He wanted to trot him out and, and say, bring him through the streets and let everybody see. Look, this is that mighty uh, King Agag. This is, this is what I did. I, I captured him. And he kept the best of these things alive. It's one of my favorite verses in scripture. And when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, Saul came to Carmel. And behold, he saw him at the place. And Samuel came to Saul, verse 13. And Saul said to him, and you can see Saul like walking out to him. And he said, blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the command of the Lord. But you didn't do it. And, and Samuel says to him, then what meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep that I hear? And the lowing of the oxen in my ears. If you had done what you were supposed to do, these animals would not be bleeding. Amen. They would not be lowing. I, I'm hearing noise from animals, which means you did obviously did not. And the fact that you try to come out and meet me on the road and you say the right things and you, and you give me some church talk and say, blessed is the name of the Lord. I've, I've done the command of the Lord. That's not going to stop me from telling you what God told me. And he literally told him. He, he said, and Saul said, they, they have brought them from the Amalekites. They did it. But see, the thing is, God didn't give them the command. He gave you the command. Right. You're the king. You're my anointed. That's why he told him, I anointed you. Now I need you to do what I say. He said, hey, they brought the sheep and the Amalekites and the people spared the best of the sheep. And then he, now you're going to try to put a church thing on it to sacrifice to the Lord our God. That's why we did it. That's like you telling me that you knocked over the liquor store over there on Lincoln Highway, but it's okay because you're going to give the money to the church. Huh? It's like, yeah, I got this $10,000 here from the liquor store we knocked over, and now I'm going to. That works, beloved. And Samuel said to him, stop, let me tell you what the Lord told me last night. Just, just, just stop. But here in verse 24, I want to show you that Saul was motivated by the masses. Because verse 24 says, and Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned for I have changed transgressed the commandment of the Lord and my words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. He was motivated by the masses. Entanglement. He was disobedient because he was motivated by the masses. And Luke 12 tells us, don't be motivated by the masses. In 1 Samuel 13, he had another assignment. He was supposed to 
wait for the apostle, apostle, excuse me. He was wait, supposed to wait for the prophet Samuel to come to him. And he was supposed to tarry for, for seven days and, and wait for him for further instructions. He was supposed to wait for further instructions. And, and, the, and, and the scripture says in, 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 in verse 8, Saul remained at Gilgal. All the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And Saul's members, men began to scatter. So he said, bring me a burnt offering. And Saul offered a burnt offering. And just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived. So maybe seven days and two hours, seven days and three hours. But but he told you to wait for seven days. He said, Terry, for seven days and then await further instructions. And so when 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 Saul looked at his watch and said, it's been seven days, he's not here. He starts he starts getting uh, concerned and says, well, let me make a sacrifice. Let me do something. No, no, that's not what you're supposed to do. And Samuel says to him, what have you done? And Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering that you did not, and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal. Don't be motivated by the mighty. He's scared. He's trembling with fear because his men are scattering and he thinks that the Philistines are going to come down and beat him. And so now he is motivated by the mighty. And when he was motivated by the mighty, he started to move in such a way that he got entangled in fear and he did something he was not supposed to do. And Samuel says, you acted foolishly. You have not met, kept the command of the Lord your God. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. So right there, he lost the ability to have the kingdom be in his line after him and then when you get to verse 15 I mean chapter 15 he loses the kingdom altogether the kingdom got stripped from him because of his disobedience again and so he was motivated by the masses in, in 1 Samuel 15 and 24 he was motivated by the mighty in 1 Samuel 13 and 11 and I already read the verse to you in verse 9 uh, verse uh, 9 when, when, we, when we talked about it Saul said bring uh, hither a burnt offering but no excuse me verse 6 we said the men of Israel saw that they were I'm sorry I'm in the wrong <laughs> I'm sorry I'm in the wrong uh, um, wrong uh, chapter but Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the oxen and the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them they made a conscious effort because of their greed to say we're not we're only going to get rid of the stuff that's bad but we're going to keep the stuff that's good don't be motivated by the money don't be greedy he got entangled because he said I want to be able to keep something for myself and then when it got went sideways he pretended like he wanted to sacrifice it to the Lord his God but that's an entanglement don't be motivated by the masses don't be motivated by the mighty don't be motivated by the money and the takeaway from the clarity that's provided in Luke chapter 12 around those three examples of entanglement clearly seen in Saul's life. The problem with entanglement is it doesn't allow you to be obedient. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to be obedient, obedience must be complete and not compromised. Partial obedience is no obedience at all. Saul said, but, but I did. I destroyed them. I killed the stuff. But I just kept the best of it alive and King Agag alive. It's like that, that doesn't get it done. I told you to utterly destroy. You didn't do it. Obedience, beloved, has to be complete and not compromised. In 1 Samuel 13, I told you, he tarried there seven days and, and he said, but when you didn't come, when you, when you didn't come on time, 
then I decided to do something else. No, obedience has to be complete, not conditional. Sometimes the delay of God is to test whether you have the perseverance to stay where you are and do what he told you to do. He said, tarry until you receive further instructions. You don't know what has held up Samuel or what's going on, but you do know he said, wait there until you get further instructions. That's what Saul should have been on. But he said, no, you didn't come. You said you were coming here by seven o'clock. It's 830. So I had to do something. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. Obedience must be complete and not compromised. It must be complete and not conditional. Why? Because obedience, beloved, is costly. Yes, it is. Yeah. Obedience is costly. You know what you have to give up to be obedient? You have to give up your will. And understand that the one who anointed you, the one who called you, the one who set you apart is the one you have to please. Don't be motivated by the mighty. Don't be motivated by the masses. Don't be motivated by the money, but be motivated by the master. Yeah. Oh, yes. Be motivated by the master. Obedience is costly. And if you acknowledge he's the master, that means you're not. And it costs you something. Amen. Obedience is costly as you move towards God because it requires self-denial. Amen. You can't say, I know I, 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 I'm, I'm starting to feel like I want to get entangled a little bit into, in a few things in the affairs of this life. I'm starting to feel a little sketchy and my mind is starting to, it's my, my mind is starting to wander and I'm starting to wonder what's happening with the people and, and, and I'm fearing for my life and I, I feel like I need to get some stuff. All of those things can happen. And when you, when you sit down with, with Jesus at your red table, table he'll say you know you can't be involved in an entanglement let me tell you what an entanglement is entanglement is disobedience and I don't need disobedience I need obedience it needs to be complete obedience not compromised obedience obedience it needs to be complete obedience and not conditional obedience why because obedience is costly it's costly as you move towards God because it requires self-denial but let me tell you this as we close Disobedience is costly as you move away from God. It's even more costly as it moves away from God because it affirms your self-determination. And it's nothing more at odds with self-denial than self-determination. It's nothing more at odds with being obedient to your master than deciding on your own which orders you will follow and which orders you will not. It can't happen. No man that warreth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. And that's why Samuel said to him, does the, the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much in obeying the voice of the Lord? He said, what's more important? Trying to get your sacrifice to the altar or obeying the voice of the Lord? Samuel said, because to obey is better than the sacrifice and to hearken is better than the fat of lambs he said for the rebellion is like the sin of div divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry because you have rejected the word of the Lord he has rejected you as king and from that day forward he, he said that the kingdom has been taken from you he said, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today, verse 28, and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. Yes. So stop begging. It's over. Disobedience is costly because it affirms your self-determination. Obedience is costly, too. It's going to cost you something to follow Christ. But you have to do it because you need to 
please him who called you and chose you to be a soldier. So we got to work on this self-denial and say, I'm not going to be motivated by the masses. I'm not going to be motivated by the mighty. I'm not going to be motivated by the money. I'm only going to be motivated by the master. And I'm not going to entangle myself Thank you, Jesus. in the affairs of this life. Of course, there are more entanglements that could be mentioned. But I just thought it was so perfect in Scripture that in Luke 12, Jesus mentions those three. And then we see those three active in the life of King Saul who had more chapters in the Bible and more verses than he needed to have. Because if he simply would have done the will of the Lord, we would be talking about him more like we're talking about Joseph. The word of the Lord comes in and tells you what to do. And you execute it and you move on. Two, three verses chops. No big... 1 Samuel 15, no Agag and hacking to pieces and bleeding of sheep and lowing of oxen. All of that doesn't happen. Samuel shows up and he says, did you do the word of the Lord? Yep, everybody's gone. We move on, chapter 16. Oh, that we might find ourselves in a place where we can be detangled from the things that might bind us today. No hypocrisy, no fear, no greed. So that when we sit down with our master, we can talk about there's no entanglement, just obedience. Because that's the skill you require for us to be kingdom strong.